Good morning, Amy, and welcome to the Local Paleo Show. Hi, thanks for having me. It's our pleasure, always. Um, good morning, Mark. How uh, uh, is Mark doing today? Mark is doing very well. I've spoken with him earlier, and he's fine. Okay, good. And this uh, makeup lady took good care of him, right? She did. She did. Okay. So, Amy, um, quick in this intro, you are a U.S. Air Force veteran. I'm impressed already. And certified nutrition specialist who specializes in using low carbohydrates and ketogenic nutrition to help people. Is that basically it, right? That's and accurate, yep. <laughs> yeah, we'll get, we'll get into more details. So first of all, uh, your background. Um, uh, now we know you're Air Force veteran. How did you switch from that to be a nutrition specialist? What prompted you to get to that new career? Right, well, I had been... Um, I spent most of my childhood and young adulthood overweight. Um, I, I didn't have any health problems, but I have a family history of type 2 diabetes, obesity, stroke, and cancer. So the family history is stacked against me, and I was carrying extra weight, and I was overweight despite doing what I thought were all the right things, right? A low-fat diet, lots of exercise, um, I've run two marathons, none of that ever helped me lose weight. And I stumbled upon the low-carb way of eating, and my entry to it was actually the Atkins diet. Um, my mother got a used copy of the Atkins book at a yard sale back many years ago when they still had yard sales. Um, and she never read it, but I did. She never bothered to read it, but I read it, and it made sense. It just made sense to me. And I gave it a try, and of course it worked. You know, my story is not unlike that of many other people. And so I was eating a low-carb diet for several years, and during that time, I was in and out of jobs that I didn't like, I wasn't really fulfilled by. And it kind of suddenly occurred to me, you know, nutritionist is a career, like maybe I could do that and I could help other people learn about low carb. And so um, after I got out of the military, I was only in for four years, after I um, got out, I went to graduate school for nutrition and I got a master's in nutrition and I've been doing, you know, nutrition professionally ever since. And I do work with clients, but I also do a lot of freelance writing in health and nutrition, mostly related to low carb and ketogenic real food type nutrition. But um, that's, that's how I got into it through weight loss. And the thing is, in all the years that I've been learning about how and why this way of eating works and the biochemistry of it and the physiology of it, at this point, in my opinion, weight loss is one of the least impressive things that this way of eating can accomplish for somebody's health. Um, yes. You know, we, we see really remarkable improvements in things like type 2 diabetes, acid reflux, PCOS, chronic pain, all these different things. Oh, and by the way, you might also lose a few pounds along the way. Yeah, yeah that's, uh, that's one thing that I do consult as well, um, probably not as much as you, but and um, every time someone approached me is with, um, I want to lose weight, I, you know, typically I say, I don't do weight loss, but if you have any real health issue, I can address that. And then in the process, you will lose weight. But right. I don't want you to focus on losing weight only because it, yeah. there has to be other con uh, condition that prevents you from losing weight. Um, so going back, uh, going back a little bit, um, can you explain uh, your battle against the false diet information, the uh, you know the government information, the um, you know low fat and and yeah, uh, I, basically? Yeah. I kind of have it easy because you know. For me, most of the clients who come to me are actually already doing a low carbohydrate or ketogenic diet and they're not getting the results they want. Um, so I don't have to convince anyone like, hey, it's okay to eat butter, it's okay to eat red meat, it's okay to eat egg yolks. They already know that. And they're just, there's a problem with implementing the diet in the correct way to get the result they want. Um, and when I, when I went to school for nutrition, 
I specifically chose the school that I chose because I knew they would be a little unconventional, so to speak. They wouldn't teach me a ketogenic diet, but they weren't going to teach me that old classic food pyramid. I mean, most of my professors knew that most people were probably eating too much carbohydrate. It was known even, even then. Um, so I, I feel like I have it lucky as a nutritionist in 2019. It's easy for me to say it's okay to eat bacon and, and no, you don't have to have your whole grain bread. You're not going to die of a whole grain deficiency. Um, but we owe that to all of the doctors and researchers that have been doing this for the past 20 years, at least doing clinical research, people like Eric Westman and Stephen Finney and Jeff Folick and, and all of these other people that have been publishing papers that are proving that this is a safe thing to do. And not only is it safe, it's really, really beneficial. So um, I think my, the way that I operate professionally is so different than it would have been if I was a nutritionist in let's say 1985 or 1995 even, um, when, when everything was still steeped in that low fat thing. And we still are to some extent, but it has changed radically over even the past five years. I'll be in a supermarket and I'll overhear people talking about like, oh, how many carbs is that? Oh, look, that's keto. You never heard that even five years ago, you would never overhear. And even in restaurants, restaurants now, it's not, um, wait staff don't, don't, um, they're not surprised at all when you ask for a hamburger without the bun or a salad without the croutons. That's pretty normal now, at least in the U.S. Um, so it's, right. I feel like I, I have it easy compared to nutritionists and dietitians 20 or 30 years ago. Okay, cool. So was there a, such a thing as a ha -ha moment for you? Um, not, there wasn't one moment. It was really that sort of lifetime of struggling with my weight, of, of doing everything that I thought I was supposed to do, of doing exercise, eating my margarine on my whole grain bread, eating my fat-free cereal with skim milk. I was doing everything I was supposed to do, and I wasn't getting the results that I should have gotten if that advice had been accurate, if that advice had been correct. And so um, in trying the Atkins diet, I've always told, I'm a, as you can see, I'm a coffee junkie. And I remember the first time I put heavy cream in my coffee instead of skim milk, and it was so thick and rich and luxurious. And I was like, am, am I going to have a heart attack right away? Or is it going to take some time for this to clog my arteries? And of course, that didn't happen. Um, so it wasn't really one aha moment. It's been even over time as I learned, I mean, almost on a daily basis, I learn new things about like I said, the biochemistry of this and how and why it works at the cellular level. And so there's like aha moments all the time, like, oh, that's why insulin does what it does. Oh, look, look what it's doing to this hormone and this enzyme. So it's lots of little moments, but I think um, looking back now, it just at a, at a high level, logically thinking about the past, when there were no government nutrition guidelines, there was no, there were no apps, there were no trackers, people just ate. And nobody was, I mean, there, there was overweight and obesity, they existed, but it was rare. It was very rare to have somebody who was three or 400 pounds. And now that's not unusual. Um, and, and so what, what did we do in the past? You know, we did a lot of things differently, but certainly skim milk didn't exist at a certain point in time these things didn't exist the technology even like things like soybean oil we didn't have the technology to extract oil from soybeans and corn kernels these things are relatively new to the food supply and so it's almost as if we want to um return to that state of health then we should maybe return to that way of eating and of course the diet wasn't the only difference but that's a big a big part of it Right, right. A couple of comments, if I may. Um, one of them is bec because I was raised in France. In France, we don't, at least that I, at, at the time, okay, maybe now it's different. We don't focus so much on diet. You, we focus on eating good food. And, and what is called now organic food was considered to be just food regular food, you know, farm fresh, you know, on the market every day. As right. you know, you know, a farmer's market started in Europe before they came to this country. So there was never any, um, you weigh yourself, you count calories and all this obsession about that. 
And secondly, uh, regarding the current state of affair uh, in, in health wise, you probably noticed that uh, our grand, even your grandparents in America were healthier than their children and then now their grandchildren. Actually, the current generation is said to be uh, possibly living less or how do you say shorter sure. lifetimes than uh, than we do and, uh, and grandparents so grandparents used to live on mostly food no processed food no fast food mm -hmm. none of that existed because like you said the technology didn't exist and now we're seeing the result the, the bad results of all this technology messing up with our food so we have a uh, abundance of uh, bad fats, you know, high carbs because it's cheap. So the influence of the industry on the nutrition level, including the government with the food pyramid, where the base was all carbs, right? Mm -hmm. The old one. It was all carbs. And you look at it, it's like, what was wrong with these people? You know? Yeah, but, so, but I would what, say, just, just as a point of... Um, to play the devil's advocate, I, I don't necessarily have a problem with processed food. And of course, it, defend, it depends on how we define processing. Everyone defines it differently. Processed food is not necessarily bad. We have to look at the metabolic effects of that food. But of course, most ultra processed food is very high in refined carbohydrate, very high in sugar and high in those industrial seed oils. But to have something like a, a stick of salami, some people would consider that a processed food or pepperoni. When when you look at what that does to blood sugar and insulin, it's very neutral. So it's it's really it depends. I, I know the point you're trying to make, but I think processed food can be a part of the solution. If if you're in a hurry and and you're hungry and and you're driving and you're going to be in the car for three hours, you can stop at a gas station and get a, a stick of string cheese or you know, like I said, a, pe a pepperoni, salami. So it's, I think it really depends, but it, it depends on how we define processed food is the issue. Right, right. Um, there's, there's, for example, when you talk about salami, or, uh, I would most likely trust European made uh, salami or ham than American made because typically they're taking shortcuts, quality is not the same, they use you know, uh, genetically engineered ingredients. I mean, that's, um, as a chef and nutritionist, I'm very picky with the quality of my food because, mm -hmm. you know, I, take, I try to take care of my body. Um, I, I totally agree. But, I, I would sooner trust a European made meat product too, but compared to a piece of cake or a cookie or a brownie, right. American yeah. made salami is still gonna be the better of those two choices. But of right. course, given given a choice between something with much more wholesome ingredients, I would prefer that. Yeah, my teacher in microbiotic always uh, used the good, better, best. Ex you right, know, it's, exactly. It's, it's better to go for better if you cannot get best, at least you avoid the bad stuff. Right. Um, okay, so, uh, in what way do you think the low-carb paleo diet helps? And uh, we'll get to more specific later. In general, obviously, it cuts out all the, the carbs and, you know, uh, most of the processed food, fast food, everything. What's your take on that? Well, so I don't want to get into too much detail if we're going to do that later, but um, all of these ways of eating eliminate the foods that really affect blood sugar the most and so many of the chronic illnesses that most people are dealing with today what we call the non-communicable illnesses things like type 2 diabetes cardiovascular disease pcos non-alcoholic fatty liver things that aren't contagious things you can't catch from somebody they just have to develop over time the majority of these come from chronically high blood sugar and chronically high insulin and so paleo low carb keto eliminate most of the foods that are the worst for those issues. Now, paleo is not low carb by definition. You can have lots of fruit, you can have starchy tubers, starchy vegetables. Um, so it really depends on someone's individual sensitivity to some of those foods. But um, I just think for the most part, all of those ways of eating help correct a deranged metabolism to some degree. 
Mm-hmm. And and if nothing else, they get people reading labels a lot more. Like we were just talking about the processed foods. If you're following a certain way of eating that prohibits certain ingredients or certain food categories altogether, you're going to look a lot more closely at the ingredient labels, and it really wakes people up to um, the, the problems with some of the food supply right now. Yeah, I always tell my clients, you need to become a lab, a label detective. You need to mm-hmm. really look and, um, you know, uh, actually sometimes I do walk to the grocery store and tell, you know, walk through the different section, tell them what to look for, what what to buy, what not to buy, and so on. So, right. um, the keto diet is fairly new. Uh, what's your take on that, on, on that the particular diet? Right. So it's actually not new. It's um, almost a century old because they were using the ketogenic diet to treat epilepsy in the 1920s um, before there were drugs to treat epilepsy. This was when um, people, people, and, and, and since then it's been used in people with epilepsy who do not respond to the anti-epilepsy medications. The thing is that type of ketogenic diet, we use the word keto, unfortunately, a lot when we really mean low carb. There's a lot of people saying they're on keto or they're doing a ketogenic diet when they're really doing a low carb diet, which is fine. The, the true classical ketogenic diet was very high in fat and limited not just in carbohydrate, but also in protein. And the children following those very, very restrictive ketogenic diets did have some issues over the long term, mostly because of the protein restriction. Um, but so the, the ketogenic diet is really not um, new. I think it was even used earlier than the 1920s. That's just the first real like clinical stuff we have on it. But carbohydrate restriction as a, either a medical therapy or a weight loss facilitator goes back even to the 1800s. I mean, there's like medical textbooks from the 1860s that talk about how, you know, the portly man should avoid farinaceous and saccharine foods. And they just had different terms for these words back then. Um, the modern incarnation of it is is pretty new. This sort of like explosion of it is new. And I think I think it's fabulous, but it's also a little bit, eh, I don't want to say dangerous, um, unfortunate, let's say, because this is absolutely positively an extremely powerful dietary therapy for many, many different things. But there's a lot of people who don't need to be so strict, who are going this direction and it's actually causing not so much physical problems as inducing a lot of fear and a lot of anxiety around food. They call it orthorexia, like literally being terrified of certain foods. um, And and it really, it's not good for mental health. And as much as I advocate for and support a low carb or ketogenic diet, not everybody needs it. Some people do perfectly fine on a higher carb diet. Nobody really needs to be eating 300 grams of carbs a day, but 100, 150, especially if you're very active, very lean, very muscular, not everybody needs keto. And I think even within the ketogenic community, there's a a lot of fear mongering about carbohydrate as a whole that doesn't really have to be that way. Yeah, yeah. Um, Actually, I should have called that the new keto diet fad. Because yeah, the new, the new, uh, you know, on the philosophical, philosophical level, uh, what is it with America and with all these diets, jumping from one diet to another and, and obsessing about them? And, uh, you know, Mark lived in France or, you know, for a long time, and he can tell you the same as I. In France, we don't obsess about food, we don't obsess in this way. We obsess over the quality. I mean, we don't really obsess. It's just natural for us. Right. But what is it with this obsession with diets? And and, and it's, you know, you move uh, five, six years ago, the big thing was a gluten-free diet. Okay. A lot of people that were not allergic to, to gluten jumped on the diet because they say, it's, you know, they're going to lose weight. And mm-hmm. then the paleo diet. And now it's the keto diet. Personally, I feel the keto diet is, is helpful in certain conditions, but it should not be applied for everyone because it could be dangerous. So, you know, on, on that level, why are Americans so obsessed with diets? 
Yeah. So I'll, 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 let me answer those in reverse order. Right. The ketogenic, everybody can do a ketogenic diet. Not everybody needs to. Not everybody right. has to, right? Everyone can. I don't think it is, um, it's not dangerous unless it's implemented incorrectly. And mm. unless if somebody's on medication for certain conditions, they need to be monitored when they make the transition because some of those medications can become too powerful in combination with the ketogenic diet. It's not the diet, it's the interaction of the diet with medications for conditions that keto improves very, very quickly. So that being said, everyone can do keto, not everyone needs to, not everyone should. The answer to the American issue, and I can really only speak for myself and my opinion and what I see in this country, um, because of the very unfortunate and very uh, incorrect government nutritional guidelines for so many years. So many of us became overweight, obese, chronically ill, and we are so terribly desperate to get well, so terribly desperate to get healthy again, to lose weight. And when they keep telling you to do the same thing you've been doing, but do it more, eat less, move more, eat less fat, eat more grain, eat more fruit. You can never have enough fruit, 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 fruit smoothies, green shakes. When you do that and you get worse and worse and you get fatter and fatter, you become more and more desperate. So, of course, you're going to latch on to anything. Oh, gluten-free might help me lose weight. Let me try that. Keto might work. Let me try that. Paleo. People are desperate. And I understand. I was desperate most of my life. Um, and, and, and yourself, my self-esteem anyway, took a huge beating because I'm blaming myself, right? What, what's wrong with me? Why can't I lose weight? You know, instead of saying, what's wrong with the advice? When, when, you know, I, I'm stealing this from other people that I've heard on podcasts. If you have a classroom, when one child or two children are failing, it's the child's fault. When the whole class is failing, it's probably a bad teacher, right? So when, when a couple of people are very, very sick and very obese, maybe those people have an issue. When, like, depending on the source you cite, like two-thirds of the American population are diabetic or pre-diabetic, did every, all mil, millions and millions of us had a willpower failure and a discipline failure, or maybe we're, the, the advice we're following is wrong. We're right. desperate. That's why. That's why. I think, I, I think it goes deeper than that as well. Is, uh, first of all, we have the enormous influence of the press uh, uh, brainwashing you or manipulating you into being skinny. Right? Mm -hmm. That's that. Not accepting your body, your body is never perfect enough. So you got to lose weight, you got to lose weight. Secondly, the government's policies that is uh, subsidizing the cheap uh, grains like, uh, you know, wheat and rice and soybean and all that, which in turn become processed food, the cheapest stuff, because the cheapest stuff is... Um, subsidized by the government and pushed by the industrial agriculture system, right. then people on the low income level, they will tend to buy this product because they are cheap, not mm -hmm. really cheap because the cost in long term, but people don't think that way. Um, so there's, there's more to it than just to, for you to take the blame for it. You know, the blame should be put on government, should be put on the old-fashioned way of looking at it and also on the political system uh, in general on the agri agriculture how it influenced government because don't tell me that agriculture huge agricultural business and did not influence the government to say oh you got to put uh, all those grains on the on the on the uh, pyramid um, mm -hmm. I've always approached, and this was in, in, in almost indoctrinated with me. Sorry, um, I'm mumbling here, trying to get my brain straight. When I was young, I grew up on a farm, small farm. I was I was lucky. I realized that later, um, and all the food we ate was pretty much pulled fresh from the garden. Mm -hmm. And it was from the garden to the table within 30 minutes, you know. 
they, my grandmother never used pesticides or any kind of toxic products. Um, so in, in France, we have a, a general attitude that we should eat a varied diet in season in reasonable amount, which is what Michael Pollan co-opted, you know, um, mm -hmm. use a varied diet in reasonable amount as fresh as possible. So if you stick to that, which is very basic and simple, then it should not be that complicated to have a normal weight. Correct. However, the issue is, if you are healthy, to, to stay healthy, that works beautifully. Yes, fresh food, local food, in season. Um, if you are already obese, morbidly obese, have type 2 diabetes, have PCOS, in order to correct that, you need a different strategy than someone who's already healthy is going to use to stay healthy. In order to reclaim your health, you need something a little more dramatic. And, and the, the kind of analogy I use is the intervention or the strategy required to reverse a problem once it already exists is not the same strategy that you need to prevent the problem from happening in the first place. And I use the example of an insect infestation in your home, for example. If, if you have an insect infestation, you can call the exterminator, they come, they spray all this toxic stuff, and guess what? The problem is solved. But you you didn't need that toxic stuff sprayed in your home to prevent the infestation. You could have kept food sealed, don't leave food sitting out on the counter, make sure the windows are closed. So I think I totally agree with you. That is a great way to be healthy and stay healthy. But for someone who is very, very unhealthy right now, they need something a little more dramatic. And over time, as they get healthier, they can probably go more in that direction. And that's how they can maintain the health once it's reclaimed. But if you tell somebody with very, very severe type 2 diabetes that they can eat all the fruit they want or all the potatoes they want just because it's coming from their backyard, that is not going to help them. But I definitely agree with you that a healthy, yes, that's, that's a perfect way to eat, but there's other situations where somebody needs something a little different, at least at first. Now, again, let me specify, I didn't say they can eat all the fruits and vegetables. Right, right, I, right. Moderation. I shouldn't have put words in your mouth, yeah. So, um, uh, switching to diabetes, because it is a huge problem and it's getting worse every day. Um, do you treat or do you work with all types of diabetes or the only type 2 and adult onset? So I mostly work with people with type 2. Um, I've had a couple of people write to me for help with type 1. I am not um, knowledgeable enough in type 1, so I have colleagues that I refer out to. I'd like to learn more, but because type 1 is so different from type 2, it's the diet is basically the same, but the way somebody with type 1 diabetes has to manage insulin injections is very right. different than somebody with type 2 who's either on insulin or who's not on insulin and is just managing it solely with diet or with um, oral medication. So um, I, can, I can help somebody with type 1 get started, but they really need someone who knows and has more experience dealing with type 1. Right, right. But then again, we, we depend on drugs. Um, I had one young client, a young girl, 12 years old, that was type 1 diabetes and control, for the most part, I would say 90%, control of blood sugar level through diet, not through drugs. Mm -hmm. So it is possible to handle, and I'm not saying it's the case for everyone, because there's also a question of willpower here. Uh, people are used to take drugs instead of doing the right thing diet-wise. Um, but it is possible to also control your blood sugar level through diet, even for type 1 diabetes. Oh, absolutely. A hundred percent. You can, people with type 1 diabetes who follow a very low-carb diet or, or whatever other approach works for them, they're, they will always require at least some insulin. Most of them will never be able to stop taking insulin altogether, but they are able to very dramatically reduce the doses that they require. And by Dr. Richard Bernstein, 
who's like the world's leading expert in type 1 diabetes, called it the law of small numbers. When you reduce the dose of insulin that you require, you reduce the likelihood for wild highs and lows in blood sugar, which is like a dream for a type 1 diabetic to have stable blood sugar throughout the day is a miracle. Absolutely, it can be mostly controlled with diet, not 100%. They will always need a little bit of insulin. Right, right. So um, going to type 2, it, it Type 2 diabetes used to be called adult onset diabetes. Now, even children have it. So how do you explain that and how do you help? I think it's explained partly by the diet, the dietary environment. Um, you know, these kids are born and, and within, within months or at least a year or two, some of them are drinking juice. They're eating lots of, you know, now we're told to wean children onto carb foods, all the packaged baby food is all sugary, but I think it probably has a lot more to do with the in utero environment. You know, Dr. Jason Fund uses the phrase marinating in insulin. Unfortunately, these babies are exposed to chronically, yeah, he's laughing because it's funny, right? These, 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 you know, growing babies are, are marinating in insulin in the womb for nine months. They are born almost hyperinsulinemic, they're born carbohydrate intolerant. So they are born already behind the metabolic curve. Then you expose them to grape juice and who knows what, pastries, you know, pureed pears with added sugar in the US and then it's a disaster. And it's, yeah. it's, it's, I think we can say for certain <clears throat> It's not because these fetuses aren't exercising enough. I always joke that, oh, we can solve childhood obesity. All we need to do is create treadmills tiny enough to implant in the womb and get these fetuses exercising from day one. I mean, this is ridiculous. It has nothing to do with exercise. Not, not in toddlers who, who are, you know, we have toddlers now, like you said, with type 2 diabetes. We have toddlers who are becoming obese. And it's not because they're not exercising enough in the womb. Right, right. Um, not to mention the super or mega soft drinks they ingest yeah. every day. Mm -hmm. Although there's a trend which is good, a trend to drink more water than, you know, or less sugary drinks. That it's, it's starting to change. People are it, finally yeah. starting to be aware that all that sugar and carbs is not good for them. Right. So how do you help your patients with uh, that have diabetes? Uh, uh, you know, give us some tips and tricks. Right. So it's um I I have to use the word clients because I'm not a doctor. So um. Okay. Like I said, most of the people who come to me are already doing a low carb or ketogenic diet, and they're not getting the results they want. And unfortunately for most of them, the result they want is weight loss. Even if they have some other kind of health problem, they're only ever looking at the scale, sadly, right? Um, with people with type 2 diabetes, in addition to just altering the diet somewhat, they may be having more carbs than they realize or maybe actually eating too much fat. That's a mistake I see a lot of people making on keto. It's not unlimited fat. Um, what I try to help them with, and I'm actually working on a blog post about this, is understanding a little more about blood sugar. Because people get very um, black and white. If, mm. if they, don't, they don't have an appreciation, they, they just measure their blood glucose at one point in time, and they get very worried if it's high or if it's low, they wonder what's going on. And it's because they don't really understand all the different feedback loops and the different overlapping mechanisms in the body that control blood sugar. And there's perfectly valid physiological reasons why your blood sugar could be, I'm going to put high in quotes because something like 110, 115, which I don't really consider that high, but somebody on a ketogenic diet who's normally maybe in the 70s or 80s with blood sugar would be very worried to see their blood sugar at 115. But as one example, during a high intensity exercise session, your blood glucose is higher because your body needs the glucose. So of course there's more of it circulating in your blood. They have to understand that. So they understand that there's actually nothing wrong whatsoever. The body is doing exactly what the body's supposed to do in that circumstance. Um, so that's really, and, and with, with the people with type two diabetes, 
sometimes, unfortunately, I have to be the one to educate them a little more about some of the medications they take. You know, the doctor gives them a pill, doesn't really explain how the pill works, doesn't explain the mechanism, so that when they go ketogenic or just even start cutting down their carbs a little bit, and they start to have weird signs and symptoms, it's very often side effects from the medication because... Yeah now that you've changed your diet so radically your whole body is changing pretty rapidly sometimes within days um and and now you're going to experience effects from the medication that you were not experiencing previously so it's really just kind of managing the whole the whole picture for that person okay okay um before we leave the diabetes subject did you have any other recommendations suggestions I, I would just say to anyone out there who has diabetes, whether type 2 or type 1, you can very, very radically help yourself by going on some version of a lower carbohydrate diet. You might not need keto, but if your, your specific condition is basically a carbohydrate intolerance, then why on earth would you want to eat a lot of carbohydrate? That's all I can say. I mean, and I, I know type one is very different. Type one is an autoimmune condition. Um, it's it's different, but you are still your blood sugar is still going to react very um, very dramatically to to carbohydrate. And so, whether it's type two or type one, you can manage that blood sugar much much better by removing from your diet the variable that affects that the most, and that's carbohydrate which is where education is extremely important. Yeah. There's not enough, uh, again, I'm sorry to go back to that, but in France, the government is more active in prevention because, because of the health social system where everyone is covered. Yeah. By, you know, um, I, I wish the healthcare system in the U.S. were different because we're basically already bankrupt. It just hasn't manifested yet but right. with the cost of care for these illnesses that our our healthcare system medicare medicaid individual families are already going bankrupt and right. um if this was like the nhs in the uk or like the system in france it sounds like if the government were paying for everybody you can bet things would be very different. There would be a lot more emphasis on, okay, how do we get people off these medications that are costing billions of dollars a year? How do we get people to not need so many procedures? Definitely. Right, right. So, uh, and, and um, I like Mark's opinion on the uh, health system in, in England. He knows a lot more than I do about that. I know about the French system, which is starting to fall apart, by the way. But the... Because the government is, so the government takes money from your paycheck every month or whatever, and then uh, basically has a healthcare budget. So their incentive is to keep the cost down because they can only tax people so much, mm -hmm. right? So to keep the cost down, they need to educate people and say, okay, you cannot, you have to stop eating all this sugar. You have to stop doing this. You have to, this is not good for you. It's going to make you sick. It's going to cost a lot, blah, blah, blah. So there's much more proactive educational system in France towards health. Starting very early on, the little little kids in school are taught how to eat. You know, they don't explain the fancy terms or anything. It's just, you know, cafeterias in France are serving much healthier food and much fresher food than mm -hmm. they do here. Definitely. So, um, I think there's a major difference here where, to where I, I feel that the American system is all about making money. So the more sick you are, the more money they make, the richer they get, and, and they encourage that. So they're not going to say, no, you got to stop eating this, you got to stop doing that. And in some cases, the agriculture and the, the drugs companies are working hand in hand. Some of them actually own agricultural companies and you know mm -hmm. so um well, and, and i would say i would say because of all that because of all those conflicts of interest in the u.s at least i would prefer that the government not give any nutritional advice whatsoever 
because they've only made it worse because even now it's almost like our government is trying to give advice but what direction is it heading in it's heading toward veganism it's heading toward plant-based which is really plant only that's what they yeah. mean when they say plant-based which i don't think is a is a healthy you know realistic way for to feed a human animal that requires certain animal nu nutrients but i would i would just i mean i agree with you i think Edu it, it would be helpful if we could educate people, but my concern is what are the children in America going to be told? Are they going to be right. told that red meat is bad for you and saturated fat is bad for you? If, if that's the case, I would rather the government stay out of it altogether. Okay. But if they're giving it, a, advice in France, how could you tell a Frenchman not to eat butter and cheese? That would never happen. Yeah. So in <laughs> France, I think the advice is very different, right? They, they would start a revolution. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, Mark, uh, I'd like to hear feedback about the health system in England. It's not as rosy as a lot of people think. Is that right? No, it, it does have its problems. Um, the basis of it is obviously very good. You know, it's free at the point of care. If you if you're ill, you can go to the hospital. You can go to the outpatient, so you can go to your um, doctor you're registered with. Um, and you'll be dealt with all right it might take time uh, if you want an operation that they don't consider life you know if you need an operation for something they don't consider life threatening then you'll go on the list and that list can be months even years long depending on what's needed um the big problem is and it's the same throughout the world is that most of the education that the medical staff get comes from the pharmaceutical companies mm -hmm. so that most of the solutions they're going to suggest will revolve around offering some sort of chemical as a way of um, alleviating the symptoms, covering up the pain, never getting to the, to the, um, the root of the problem, the cause of yes. the yeah. um, What that has done, that particular approach, the pharmaceutical approach, means that the resources that the National Health Service has are being stretched um, beyond um, really what they can cope with um, they're spending a lot more on drugs this you know it's how can i put it they if they if they can't um, poison something you've got with a chemical or cut it out with an operation or burn it with radiation then they can't help you um, that said if you've got a broken leg or you've had some sort of physical trauma and you're uh, you know you need to be um, bolted back together that's very good and that's probably the same through most of the western world i would have thought right uh, so Thank it's you. it's becoming stretched. It's um, it's not as good as it could be, but I say a lot of that is down to a lot of middle management making stupid decisions and costing a lot of money on the payroll. Right. I would I would say it's the same in the U.S. Despite the fact that the the management of the system is so different, um, or, or the structure of the system is so different, I th everything you just said about the U.K. system could be said about of the U.S. I think. Yeah, but the, right, the, right. I mean, coming back to Alan's point, the fact that it's paid for by the government, um, and well, I say, say it's paid for by the government, we do have um, national insurance contributions off, which is taken off your wage. It's like an extra tax, um, which can be quite a lot for some people, but it's the same for everybody. If you see what I mean, it's it's the same proportion more or less. Yeah. So from that point of view, it's quite fair. Um, but that's only a finite resource. They they can only take so much. And once that money runs out, then, you know, the government has to step in and subsidise it. And they don't want to do that. So from that point of view, that does mean to say that the cost of operations, the cost of treatments and so forth are limited by the market forces. And the market forces is the cap the government puts on it. Mm. Yeah. yeah. It's the same in France, even though uh, in France it's slightly different. You still have to pay up front and then government reimburses you afterwards. So there's not like, it's not like free treatment up front. But I've noticed that uh, a couple of years ago, I went back to France and I was, uh, <clears throat> I had some kind of food poisoning or something going on. And um, the going to the doctor was like 30 euros yeah. for uh, consultation. Here it's like, hundred fifty dollars just for ten years <laughs> consultation right mm. and you have to pay a front and you're not paid back you're not reimbursed so um 
there's definitely governments in social uh, healthcare system uh, do put caps on what the doctors can charge and the uh, surgeon and so on and so forth. So um, there's pros and cons in that, but we, we, thanks to me, we moved away from the main, <laughs> the main discussion. So back to Amy. And uh, I'd like to address a subject that I'm um, uh, very interested in uh, because my mother has Alzheimer's disease. Actually, to be true, they don't really know whether it's Alzheimer or dementia or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and you wrote a book called The Alzheimer and and it Antidote. Right. Um, so, first of all, can you explain from your point of view what and uh, how and to be the we do right. again and so on and so forth and they say this. Yes, okay, and right. So I, my book is The Alzheimer's Antidote. I was asked to bring props. I don't have any English. I sold out of all my English versions. I have to get more from my publisher. So this is, I think this is the Dutch version, and we have a Spanish version there. So I, I happen to have my foreign language editions handy, but my book is called The Alzheimer's Antidote. People can find that on Amazon. Um, they regularly now call Alzheimer's disease type 3 diabetes or diabetes of the brain. And the reason they call it that is the fundamental problem in the brain of somebody with Alzheimer's is that neurons in affected areas of the brain have lost the ability to get energy from glucose. It's basically a fuel shortage problem in the brain. And over time, as this decline in the brain glucose usage, you know, declines further and further, um, the neurons actually start to atrophy. They start to wither and shrivel up. And you can see this on an MRI. You can see that the physical volume of the brain is shrinking. And this process actually begins much younger. It takes a long time before the symptoms start to manifest. Um, they can detect this decline in what they call the cerebral metabolic rate of glucose. This is detected in people as young as their 30s and 40s. And these people have no signs and symptoms of Alzheimer's, right? They're still young, they're still healthy. Their brain at that point is compensating for that reduced fuel. As that decline goes on and on, at some point it crosses a threshold. Then you start having memory problems, then you start having personality changes. But by the time those symptoms come, the disease process, which is that loss of fuel to the brain, by the time you have those symptoms, that disease process has been in place for many years. And I think that's probably why it's so difficult to make a dent in this. But that's, um, we don't, we have no idea what causes it. Like, like you said, there's a lot of theories. We don't know for sure. We do know that chronically high insulin, even in the presence of normal blood sugar, right? So this is not, even though they call it type three diabetes, a lot of people with Alzheimer's disease have normal blood glucose but they, the glucose is only normal because it's kept in check by very, very high insulin. And chronically high insulin is a major risk factor for Alzheimer's disease, regardless of somebody's family history, regardless of genetic factors, regardless of anything. And so when you look at what's happened over the past several decades with the incidence of type 2 diabetes and obesity and cardiovascular disease and non-alcoholic fatty liver and all of these other conditions that we know are driven by chronically high insulin, it's no surprise that the same thing is happening to Alzheimer's. And, and there are other factors that contribute that I think are also nutritionally based and lifestyle based, like a B12 deficiency alone can cause cognitive impairment. Um, poorly treated, uh, unrecognized hypothyroidism can cause cognitive impairment. So there's a lot of different things coming into it, but I think diet, um, you know, when it comes to things like type two diabetes or cardiovascular disease, we don't even question anymore whether diet and lifestyle play a role, if not a, a primary role. No one even pretends like that's, oh, oh, what you eat has no effect on heart disease. Of course it does. We might disagree which aspects of the causing diet is that mere possibility that this could be every bit a diet and lifestyle illness, just like all those other things whose incidence has skyrocketed in the same way that Alzheimer's has. And this, this used to be exclusive to elderly people, right? Like, oh, grandma, grandma's senile, grandpa's losing his mind. 
But we now have people in their 50s and 60s afflicted with this. So mm -hmm. something is changing radically. This can't be solely due to genetics. It can't be solely due to some virus. It's happening younger and younger, just like we talked about the diabetes now happening in little kids. We see the same thing with Alzheimer's. It's not happening in little kids, but it is happening in people ever younger. So let's, uh, let's ask the hard question. Is there a direct connection between intake of carbohydrates and sugar, refined sugar, with Alzheimer? I don't know if they've studied that. I would imagine yes, but I, I can't say for sure. I don't think they know right. for sure. There, there okay. is a link. There is an association between the chronically high insulin mm -hmm. and risk for Alzheimer's. And chronically high insulin in most people is going to come from continuous intake of refined carbohydrate, but I, we can't say for sure. Right. I recently read an article, Dr. Mercola, uh, that pointed in that direction. There's a link between, you know, uh, <clears throat> typically it's more visible in uh, diabetic and pre-diabetic people that tend to have Alzheimer earlier and faster than the rest of the population. Have you seen that connection? Yeah, yeah, I have. And in fact, you know, I, I'm sure you know the phrase metabolic syndrome, right? Right. So metabolic syndrome is basically chronically high insulin. They now have coined the phrase, you can find this in PubMed, you can find this in research papers, they call it metabolic cognitive syndrome. Because a lot of people with a cognitive impairment, and not all, some people have cognitive impairment injury to the head, so it's not all Alzheimer's. Many of other signs and symptoms of metabolic syndrome, even if they're undiagnosed. They might have the chronically high insulin, they might have high triglycerides, low HDL. Um, so there's, there's usually other signs, and it's just that very few people are putting all those pieces together to create that clinical picture. They're, they're looking at like little things in isolation that they don't think are related, but in fact, they are all completely interconnected. Right, right. Let me tell you a little story. My, my mom was addicted to sweet stuff to the point of like drug addicts or alcoholics, she would hide, she had the cache of candies or this and that because my sister was trying to take him away mm -hmm. and she would have to go through the house and look into every <laughs> nook and cranny to find the, the, the candies and so on and right. so forth. And so, uh, first of all, one thing that intrigued me is why is it that as we age, we seem to have more and more interest in sugar, right? eating sugary stuff than other stuff? And mm -hmm. then obviously we already discussed the, co the potential connection here. Um, I, I have to catch myself sometimes to not, to force myself to not eat the next a cookie or something like this because it's also, um, I feel like the cookie is calling me out, <laughs> you know, eat me, eat me, I, I, you know. And so, um, can you explain or is there a reason why older people tend to be more attracted to sugary stuff? And that is, norm I would consider myself normal. I don't have diabetes, I don't have pre-diabetes mm -hmm. or anything. What, what's what leads to this attraction to sugary stuff as you get older? Um, I honestly don't, I don't know. I can speculate. I can give my thoughts on it. I don't know if anyone really knows for sure if this has been studied scientifically. Um, I think that as we age, our digestive capacity sort of naturally declines a little bit. We're not quite as able to digest things as we were when we were younger. And it may be that those refined carbohydrates are much more easily digested than something like a big steak or a big pork loin. I, that's my guess. And then uh, the other issue is certainly not with you as a chef, but for other people and especially people much older than you are, it's easier to have a bowl of cereal for dinner than it is for them to cook a whatever, an omelet, or to stand and have to cook some type of elaborate meal. Although you as a chef know, it takes only minutes to, to grill a steak, right? Or to you, if you have a slow cooker, you can put a pork loin in there and you don't even have to cook it at all. You just walk away for a few hours and it's done. Yeah. But people don't think of that. And so I think it's especially for elderly people who live alone, it's easier to have a blueberry muffin for a meal yeah. than to try to cook something. And, but, but, but as to the physical craving, 
I don't, I honestly don't know why we crave more. Well, I guess it's self-perpetuating uh, situation. Uh, I think it's an issue of energy. Uh, if you know you're going to get quick energy from some sugary food, Mm -hmm. And it's easy and it's available and, uh, you know, you just have to grab the box from the cupboard. Yeah. Uh, now with instead of having, uh, you know, having to cook, uh, you know, a meal because especially when you live alone, it's more complicated to cook for one person than it is for four. Exa exactly. It seems right. not wasteful, but it seems like why bother? But I would say that um, they have noticed a correlation between people who do have Alzheimer's, people with Alzheimer's, and uh, increased sugar intake, meaning after they already have the illness, they want more and more sugar. And if I had to guess, I would say that's the brain demanding fuel, even though the brain can't really process that, that glucose. Maybe if you flood the system enough, some will get in there. And I think right. maybe that's the sort of unconscious way of the brain trying to say, I'm starving, please give me some energy. And right, right. That's, that's just a guess, though. Right, right. No, I, um, it makes sense. It makes sense. Um, so uh, tell us about your book. What do you explore in your book and how do you approach the uh, Alzheimer issue? Right, so my book is um, basically a guide to using a lower carbohydrate or ketogenic diet as a nutritional intervention for Alzheimer's. And the whole first section of the book is specific to Alzheimer's. What, like I said, what, what is going wrong in the brain? Um, why might this be happening? Other aspects that play into it, like the genetic factors, um, other issues. And then the whole rest of the book is how to do a low carb diet without going crazy. Um, everybody's making it so much more complicated than it needs to be. And it's very straightforward, here's what to do. And I also have chapters on explaining why it's okay to eat butter and egg yolks and the cholesterol won't kill you and the red meat won't kill you because this, my goal was to get this information to not to preach to the choir, you know, a lot of people in the low carb community already know this type three diabetes thing. I want to get this information to people living with this disease and their loved ones and caregivers who've never heard any of this. And so a lot of this is brand new to them. If I'm going to tell them, eat, you know, eat egg yolks, eat butter, eat cheese, eat beef, eat pork, I have to explain why that's not going to harm them. So that's, that's part of the book. But it's really the rationale why why should a ketogenic diet have any impact on this disease? And the answer is, if the main problem in the Alzheimer's brain is that the brain is not metabolizing glucose properly, so it's basically starving, we need to feed the brain. We need to give these neurons some other fuel. And it turns out, and this has been researched over and over, it turns out even though these cells cannot metabolize glucose properly, they do metabolize ketones. And ketones are produced when you have a very, very low carbohydrate intake. The way it changes your whole metabolism, you end up producing ketones, and ketones are a very, very efficient fuel for the brain. And you can get ketones in other ways if you use, I'm sure some listeners are familiar with coconut oil or MCT oil. It's a special kind of fat that the body converts more readily into ketones even when somebody is not on a low carb diet. Those fats will still elevate the ketones a little bit. Right. Now I have to ask, do you have a French version of your book? I don't think there is one yet, but let's get on that. We need to, so yeah, what usually, yeah. What usually happens is the foreign publisher contacts my publisher or sometimes they contact okay. me and I put them in contact with I would love to have a French version okay <laughs> yeah I'm getting I'm getting let's a little do it. upset here like yeah. what's going on here let's so, do it so um, uh, this is a very interesting subject I tried to convince my family to look into that but um, pretty much the same reason as most American will just completely uh, uh, deny, um, they don't seem to be interested. Say, well, you know, doctor is taking care of it, so don't, you know, don't come in with your nutrition stuff, you know. It's like right. they don't seem to realize there's something to it. But um, yeah. so it's, it's, um, it's basically a lost cause. I have no allies in France to help me, you know, uh, talk to the doctor about, I mean, I went, so I went to visit a couple of years ago, and it was already there. And um, in the 
she's in a retirement, a medical a retirement home where there's doctors that keep an eye on them. And um, lo and behold, they serve, they serve them cookies and they have candies available all day long. Yeah. It's like, hello. I mean, yeah, and, and they look at you like, what's wrong with him? I mean, it's like yeah. the, the, they, they, as in the patient or the, the older folks, are demanding sugar. Mm -hmm. And so they give it to them. Yeah. Not, not realizing that giving sugar aggravates their case. Right. And which I, is I, very upsetting. Yeah. Very it's, upsetting. Yes. And it's, it's the same here. And I think part of it is to appease the patient. I mean, we know people with this condition can become belligerent. They can become argumentative. And so sometimes it's just easier. Give them what they want. Give them a piece of cake. Make them happy. And in a way, I do understand it. Because if you have somebody, if somebody is so far gone, I don't think it's ever too late. I think it's always worth trying to improve somebody, but there are going to be cases where somebody is so far gone that it doesn't, nothing you do is going to help. And we should just let that person live out the rest of their days in enjoyment and peace. And it's, you know, I would say the same about somebody with stage four lung cancer. Are you going to tell that person to stop smoking now? let them have their cigarettes and, and, and die in peace, you know, because at that point, what is stopping the smoking going to do? And right. I, I mean, I agree with you. I wish it wasn't that way. And if you have somebody in a much more mild state, then, oh, that would drive me crazy. I mean, we're just, you know, we're, we're exacerbating the problem. But if somebody has a very, very severe illness, mm -hmm. it's, it's almost like you, you might as well just let them enjoy. And it's, it's very, it's very sad. It's very sad because yeah. you even said, you know, the doctors are managing it, but they're not. There are no effective pharmaceutical drugs for this condition whatsoever. There are right. drugs on the market. They're mostly completely ineffective. At best, at very best, they very slowly um, retard the decline. They may make, make the progress, make, make the worsening be slower. It still worsens. It just worsens more slowly. That's at best what these drugs do. They don't right, stop it. Right. They don't make it better. Yeah, my sister, that's my sister's approach, you know. And she, uh, it's basically um, let her have what she wants and, and, and be it. You know, she's 89 years old. She's, and uh, like you said, <laughs> when she's in a withdrawal, she can be very nasty. Right. It can be very yeah. nasty. It's, it's a it's, terrible condition. It's terrible. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's not funny, uh -huh, but it's uh, I've observed that uh, it's like talking to a completely different person all yeah. of a sudden. Not yeah. only they don't know you're there, but then they act like um, a complete stranger that's very angry or very uh, uh, argumentative and, and, and ugly in some kind. I mean, uh, wow, yeah. I didn't oh, even I think, know. I think the hardest, <laughs> the hardest job in the Alzheimer's world is the caregiver the, or, or the yeah. family, the people that have to try to manage this person over time, or even just to, just to watch it, just to watch it happening is so, it's so terrible. Yeah. And that's, that's really almost, almost worse than the person living with it is the family, the loved ones that have to watch it happen. Yeah, and for that, I, I have to thank my sister because she's dealing with that. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm here, you know, thousands of miles away I can't do anything I can only help yeah. financially but that's that's about and when I try to offer advice they won't listen to me anyway so it's like what's the point right so anything else you'd like to add about your book um, uh, yeah I mean the book really even though the title has Alzheimer's in it like I said, two-thirds of the book is really just about doing a low-carb diet, um, mm -hmm. very simply, very straightforward. So I think it's a, it's a perfectly good book for someone, whether they have Alzheimer's or not. You can skip the whole first section and just skip to the section about implementing the diet. Um, it's, I, you know, someday maybe I'll write a condensed version that's just how to do the diet because, like I said, people are making this diet so much more complicated and so much more expensive and so much more um, just 
prohibitive, like you have to measure your glucose and measure your ketones and fast and do this and that. And you really don't. I mean, the place to start and the thing that gets the, the majority of the benefits is just having a very low carbohydrate intake. All that other stuff can help, you know, um, going a certain period of time without food, if you want to call that intermittent fasting or time-restricted eating, um, the quality of the food, all of these things help. But what really flips that metabolic switch is the lower carbohydrate intake. Um, and I, I think there's a lot of people just making this into something that it doesn't need to be. And it's turning a lot of people off. A lot of people that can be very dramatically helped by this way of eating are never going to try it because from the get-go, they're thinking, oh, that's like, I can't afford that or it's so crazy, I can't do it. And it's, it doesn't have to be that way. Okay. Mark? Yeah, really interesting stuff. Um, and it's, it's great to, to see somebody really... You know, take the Alzheimer's connection as seriously as you have. That's uh, you know, it's very good. Thank you for that. Um, do you see a, a connection between the occurrence of Alzheimer's and the um, the control of cholesterol by drugs? And oh, that? yeah, excellent question. Um, I don't know if they've correlated yet long-term use of statin drugs with incidents of Alzheimer's, but certainly we know for sure because it's all over, even the official government websites, the US FDA's website states very clearly that uh, confusion, memory loss, and things like that are known recognized side effects of statin drugs. Mm. Um, not so much some of the other cholesterol lowering uh, medications that work through other mechanisms, but the statins specifically work by inhibiting your body's own making of cholesterol. So mm. for anyone out there who's new to this, your body, your own body produces more cholesterol than you could ever get from diet, you know, unless you were living on nothing but like egg yolks and butter and, and you'd have to eat a lot of that. Um, and so, and the brain, about 25% of all the cholesterol in your body is in the brain. Mm. Every single neuron, every single myelin sheath, you cannot have healthy cognitive function without cholesterol. And so I do think lower cholesterol is a much, much bigger problem than high cholesterol. Mm. And I don't think that this is a coincidence that we have millions upon millions of people on statin drugs for years, years. What do we think would happen to cognitive function when somebody's body has been deprived of adequate cholesterol for 10 or 20 or 30 years? And it's mm. not that the body makes no cholesterol on statin, it just makes a lot less than it would without the medication. To me, you, you shouldn't, I, I shouldn't have to explain why statins could adversely impair cognitive function. Somebody should have to explain why they wouldn't. Look at the mechanism, the biochemistry of how statins work, and now tell me why they wouldn't affect the brain. Yeah, yeah. Because it, it's curious. I mean, the two things we've been talking about today, um, you know, firstly, um, diabetes, and secondly, Alzheimer's, to my mind, they're all um, something that happens down the line to somebody who starts taking statins. It's almost inevitable they're going to get one or the other or both quite often. Well, I mean, certainly like statin use isn't the only thing that causes type 2 diabetes. There's plenty right. of people with that who don't, who aren't on statins. And same with Alzheimer's. It's not, it's not the only thing. I think it's one among many contributing factors, certainly. And they've shown over and over again that higher cholesterol is actually correlated with better cognitive function, especially in very elderly people. Yeah. And older people with higher cholesterol tend to live longer. And we don't, we can't say that that's causative, like higher cholesterol makes you live longer. We don't know, we can't say that for sure, but certainly the higher cholesterol later in life is not harmful if these mm. people are living longer with better cognitive function. And getting back to your point about the diabetes, Again, same thing about the US FDA and now statin drugs come with a warning that there is a, an increased risk for developing type two diabetes with statin use. I've written blog posts about this. And, and again, I can show you why when you look at the mechanism of how statins work and what they do, of course they increase risk for diabetes. Why wouldn't they? When you look at how they affect at the cellular level and at the mitochondria, what these drugs are doing it is no surprise to me at all that people have an increased risk for diabetes after using these drugs for years and years. Well, I mean, frankly, I don't know anybody 
who is taking statin drugs, who doesn't have diabetes or isn't on the way to having diabetes. Well, and, and part of that, at least in the U.S., I don't know about the U.K., but in the U.S., the standard of care for diabetes is to put you on a statin. So if they were not on a statin before, when they get diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, they will probably be put on one almost regardless of yeah. what the cholesterol level is. It's just the standard of care, which is really unfortunate. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I've got a very jaundiced view of a lot of medication. Statin is one of my pet hates. Yeah. My, my, mine too. You know, it's <laughs> what I call a starter drug. If they can get you on statins, they know they're going to get you on other things down the line. So, and, 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 and on things to deal with the side effects from the statin. Exactly. Right? Yeah. They'll put you on the statin and on two or three other drugs to deal with the side effects. Yeah. It's a real, it's a great money-making scheme. It's a great, yeah. it's a great business model. It is, yep. it is. <laughs> anyway, we, we all know the ph pharma pharmacological industry is just out to kill us and uh, but keep uh. us alive as long as possible on as many drugs as possible. So let's just take that as a given. <laughs> well, and there, but before I get, you know, I don't want anyone to like really sue me. Like there are some helpful drugs out there. Like there, there are some life-saving drugs, but yeah, as that doesn't have nothing to do with what you said. <laughs> <laughs> Super job. Um, coming back just to that sort of other thing there, you say the brain is starved of glucose. Um, What is the what is the one or two things that somebody can do to make sure that their brain doesn't get starved with glucose? Um, we don't know for sure. Right. Based on my understanding of this condition of Alzheimer's disease or of, of you know long term dementia in general, probably the most important thing somebody can do is maintain blood sugar and insulin within a healthy range for right. their lifetime. Yeah. for their lifetime and that doesn't that doesn't mean everybody needs a low carb diet some people can eat a very generous amount of carbohydrate and and be fine in that regard many of us can't and i also think probably a, a big issue too is getting all the critical nutrients we need especially b12 choline zinc i mean there's healthy co healthy cognition doesn't happen in a vacuum the brain requires a lot of these nutrients and so i think we have the perfect storm with this chronically high blood sugar and insulin from the diet. And also, you know, our food supply is so refined. And with so much fear mongering about red meat and, and other, some of the most nutritious foods on the planet, some of the most nutrient rich foods we're being told to avoid. So people mm. are having B12 deficiency now. They're having inadequate choline, inadequate carnitine, zinc, iron, you name it. So I think it's just eating a nutrient-rich diet that helps maintain your blood sugar and insulin and the amount of carbohydrate and the types of foods any one person can consume and do that will vary yeah super okay well i've got lots of other questions but i think they're going to take us round in circles again so um we can have those again another time when your next book comes out yes <laughs> super job alan back to you um, yeah, the one question that's important is uh, how can we find information about your services and your book? Oh, thank you. So my website is tuitnutrition.com. It's T-U-I-T nutrition.com. And uh, you can find information about how to work with me there. There's a tab that says work with me or services. Um, I have a YouTube channel by the same name, Tuit Nutrition, and that's also my handle on Twitter. And I am in the process of working on a new book right now. It's called The Stall Slayer. I like, I like alliteration, the Alzheimer's antidote, The Stall Slayer. Um, and that's basically a book about breaking fat loss stalls on a ketogenic or low-carb diet. And I hope to have that out by the end of September or possibly October. Uh, I'm not sure, but I'm working on it now. Cool. cool. Definitely. I wrote one like that oof, 10 years ago. <laughs> and... I'm sure it'll be very popular. Right. I hope so. I hope so. I mean, it's, it's, it's really the number one question I get and the number one reason people contact me is stalled yeah. weight loss. That's um, good. Okay. Um, Close. Well, well, we'll make sure to have you back when... Uh, uh, please let, uh, let us know when your book is coming out so we can invite you for another show. Sure. Thank you. I like that. We, we, we like to do repeat, uh, you know, Especially with people we like. 
Uh -huh. oh. <laughs> well, and let me know when this is live too, so I can share. You know, share it oh, online. Sure, yeah. sure. Yeah, and Loretta will take care of that. She's very good at it. Okay. So, um, anything before I do the closing? Think that's no. it for me. That's it. Yeah, you told us a lot of good information. So here we go. Thank you again, Amy, for being on the Low Carb Paleo Show. And as we say in Texas, à votre santé, y'all. You hear that everywhere in Texas. You can't go in a store without you. <laughs>